On Bill Weekend on and Champion of Vegon Chebai, Tunia Hall in Pidino Hile, Captain Govindra Singh Hunjan. Ama Hile, flight pilot here, he to in a carrier Tung Tang Ho Pidina, he a COVID break so in Lamka Hong Kong Kazenzina, he a carrier Lampang Ho Pidini. First of all, sir, thank you so much for coming to the show. You're welcome, and uh, I'm, I must say that I, I'm very humbled and I'm very, very thankful that you gave me an opportunity to meet you and to be able to come on board online and share my experiences with you. Thank you very much. How do you like the place? How, how do you get associated with this place? Well, my primary association is because of my wife. Mm -hmm. So, as we say in the Bible that uh, mm -hmm. God took Adam's rib mm -hmm. and he made Eve out of it. Mm -hmm. So I believe that God put my rib somewhere in Manipur. So far away from your place. So right? far away. <laughs> <laughs> so I came one day looking for it and I mm. found my rib. And mm. uh, that's how I believe the association happened. And uh, what I also feel is that uh, this is one very amazing thing that I feel about the Northeast community mm. is that it is not about marrying just the girl. Mm. I feel that I'm married to the entire community. It's mm. like the entire community has come forward and mm. accepted me as their makpa, as their son-in-law. <laughs> so I'm very, very, very grateful. That. Yeah, in this part of uh, Norris, especially in this time, we don't have much pilot. So you could be one person who can inspire next generation young, uh, and also you can set some light on how to become what career, uh, how should they set their career to become a pilot. Can you tell us something about yourself, your background, how, how you come into this profession? Um, I'm actually from a Sikh background mm. and uh, I was uh, not born in India, I was born mm. elsewhere. And uh, I was very young when we moved back to Delhi. Mm -hmm. And I remember that during my very early days, when I was three years old, four years old, when we used to fly from Africa to Delhi, mm -hmm. the pilots would allow me to come into the cockpit mm -hmm. and actually sit down and ask them questions about mm -hmm. what the flight is. I'm, ve I'm talking very young, I'm talking like three, four years old. Mm -hmm. And from that time onwards, my mother tells me that mm -hmm. it was my passion, I used to tell her, mm -hmm. that one day I'm going to become a pilot. And I believe that it was that desire and mm. that uh, passion to fulfill that desire that actually led to this place. But it took me fairly long. I was only uh, 28 years old when I started my flight training. Mm. And I finished when I was 29. And I got my job with Air India when I was 34. Mm. So it's a very uh, costly affair. It's not an easy thing it's there's a lot of money involved in it mm. so it took me some time to raise that funds mm. go to a good flight training school get mm. flight trained come back to India wait mm. almost four years mm. to get a job and then I go, landed this job in Air India in 2007 can you tell us in particularly which college you are studying and what course you are taking to become a pilot uh, my original graduation I'm actually an English graduate I've done mm. uh, BA English honors which I did from Delhi University. But for my flight training, I looked at America, I looked at Philippines, I looked at Australia, and I looked at Canada. I looked at UK also. I studied the brochures of many flight schools over there. Uh, UK, Canada, and India share Commonwealth rules. So the Canadian flight rules and Indian flight rules are very common. Mm. So converting a Canadian license to an Indian license is much more easier than mm. converting an American license to an Indian license. Mm. And uh, my sister is settled in Canada, so mm. there was some some kind of a support also from that side. Mm. So I decided to go to Canada. Which, so in, which particular college? I went to uh, Vancouver city, mm. um, in a city in British Columbia. Mm. And south side of Vancouver, there is a place called Delta. So mm. in Delta, there is this flight school which I went to. It's called the Professional Flight Training mm. Institute. It was a one-year course, about 11 months course. 
and it started uh, i started i joined that course in february 2002 and i finished it in uh, january 2003 about 11 months it took me to train how difficult it is to get into that kind of institution to become a pilot what degree does it take one is to become the the process itself to get admission in a flight training institute is not very difficult mm. Mm, it it is not so much academically oriented as much mm. it is physically oriented by that i mean uh, many people they say almost 33% of the population is partially mm. color blind mm. and you don't realize it in your everyday work you will not realize that you don't have color depth perception but mm. that is a no for becoming a pilot so like that there are some medical requirements which are more important Mm. then actually the academic requirements academically uh, i am an average student i am not uh, a very brilliant student as such so academically it doesn't take that much if you go to a good flight training school and you have the desire to fly mm. they will teach you you have to put in hard work for sure to mm. become a seriously good pilot mm. but it is the medical which i feel is more important mm. so because i was already in the aviation industry i was working in jet airways at that time mm. so i had a pilot who guided me he told me first you get your medical check done in mm. india so once you clear your indian medical check mm. then you will know for sure that mm. you are eligible for your flying training mm. so because there are people who go to canada mm. or america they do their mm. flight training they come back when they appear for the indian medical exam they fail the exam mm. so i think the very first step which i would always encourage all the youngsters to be is to mm. get your medical done so that you know for sure that you are physically okay to mm. get a license you have mentioned the medical part is a very big issue what are the main things that they are what they are, they are looking in a person who wants to take career in uh, as a pilot number 1 is your eyesight hmm. so eyesight uh, even correctable with glasses is allowed in civil flying in military flying they don't allow hmm. then your hearing power your hearing hmm. power has to be correct hmm. then basic uh, breathing heart hmm. lungs kidney they should be just generally healthy hmm. there shouldn't be a, a cardiovascular disease or there should not be a hole in the heart hmm. there are many such benign conditions which are not easily uh they don't show up easily in your normal day to day life but mm. when you undergo a, a, a medical exam for flight uh, license that is the time they catch that by and large i think uh, 60 70% of the population who doesn't have any major sickness mm. by and large i think medically they are okay to join flight training you have tried out different uh, flight schools how is the expense during your studies how much it costs you indian rupees Um, and what would be the price now to study flight uh, yeah I, i'm i'm very glad school. that you asked that question because <laughs> when i studied to mm. what it is now there mm. is a large difference you are right about that mm. i went right after 911 911 mm. happened in september 2011 mm. uh, 2001 and i went in february 2002 mm. flight training had virtually stopped in america and canada mm. when i went there as a student mm. the flight school was empty so they were giving discounts they were asking people <laughs> to come and join mm. so i could choose my aircraft i could mm. choose my instructor mm. so i finished in about uh, my stay and everything included in about 26 lakh rupees at that time that was about 52000 canadian dollars mm. today to do flight training my son has just finished flight training mm. Mm. and we have spent above 60 lakhs on his mm. flight training the same amount your son is studying the same school or he is in another flight school no he went to america mm-hmm. and i i checked with my school as well and mm-hmm. uh, then i checked with this school and this is a newer school then mm-hmm. my my school my school is very old mm-hmm. and so this is a newer school and they had a uh, mm-hmm. experience of training indigo pilots mm-hmm. they were running the indigo cadet program mm-hmm. so i decided to let my son go into this flight school instead of my flight school but my flight mm-hmm. school was also an option for me at that time yes. So sorry it's very exciting glamorous to be in the air with with a jet set lifestyle what are the stress and what are the perks of being a pilot um my wife likes to put the perk in one line mm. so she <laughs> says that uh, whenever you meet a new person and the person asks you what do you do so mm. you say i'm a doctor so then they'll ask you okay which hospital are you working what speciality are you what are you an engineer what do you do 
So she says that whenever somebody asks what your husband do, he's a pilot, and the chapter is closed. They <laughs> did not ask for that. <laughs> the word pilot itself carries so much of uh, honor and respect in this society. So you definitely, I mean, there's there's sense of amazing pride mm. when I walk with my uniform. Hmm. And when I'm uh, operating a Boeing triple seven, I I used hmm. to fly a Boeing triple seven non-stop, hmm. 16 hours to hmm. US. Some of the toughest flights in the world. We used to do those flights. Hmm. So definitely, there are lots of perks associated with that. Hmm. But as you rightly said, there are challenges with it as well. Hmm. Um, when a student is very young and he wants to join flight training and wants hmm. to become a pilot and he has that uh, passion to fly. So he does not realize that it is just like any other job. After some time, mm. you need to be consistent. You need to be able to get up at two in the morning when mm. the whole city is sleeping, your family mm. is sleeping, your children are sleeping. You will get up at two in the morning. By three in the morning, you are out mm. of your house. Mm. By four o'clock, you are at the airport. Mm. You are preparing for the flight, which will take off at five o'clock. Mm. So you 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 may have to do that half a year, six months in a year, mm. and. If you are a person who likes to party till 10 in the night, 11 in the night, you cannot get up at two in the morning and operate a flight. Mm. You have to have those eight hours, 10 hours of sleep mm. before that. So there are a lot of sacrifices also involved with it. Mm. You are flying on. You may be flying on your children's birthday. Mm. You may not get off. You will be flying on Sundays. You could be flying on a Christmas day. Mm. I have flown multiple times on 31st of December, multiple times. Because last minute there are people who report sick mm. and my in my company I'm popular that mm. if we call Govindra, Govindra will accept the flight. Last minute they will call and say, Govindra, you know, the Paris mm. flight, the uh, the pilot has reported sick, we need you to operate. Mm. So many times I've operated on 31st. Mm. So those are other sides of sacrifices mm. that you should be ready to mm. make when you go, go into a career like this. Mm. You can forget about your 9 to 5, mm. Monday to Friday job. Saturday mm. off, Sunday off, you, you can forget about that. I mean, that is a sacrifice one needs to make. Mm. But at the same time, in the words of Leonardo da Vinci, mm. he said, once you are up in the sky, once you have tasted the sky, mm. you will forever walk the ground looking upwards because mm. the thrill of being in the air, mm. being away from the ground, being up there in the clouds, mm. flying, that freedom associated with it is mm. just exhilarating. I mean, it's it's beyond anything that Mm. one can imagine. Mm. I remember my first mm. days of flight training. Mm. I was so overwhelmed when we mm. took off and we went into the air mm. and I was just looking around that I'm mm. in the air, there is nothing below me, you know. It's, it's <laughs> a definitely a very, very exhilarating experience. Mm. And if you get into it because you're passionate about it, mm. you will forever work your life through it. You will continuously want to be a better pilot. You will mm. enjoy the trade for the rest of your life. Mm. So what I always tell youngsters whenever they ask me about it mm. is that pursue your dream, whatever mm. dream you have. Mm. If you have a dream to fly, don't give it up. It mm. took me very long. People mm. like my son, he mm. became a pilot when he was 18 and a half years old. Mm. I became a pilot when I was almost 30. Mm. So I, I didn't give up. But mm. don't give up your dream. If you have a passion for flying, mm. Pursue it. God will open a door for you. One day that door will open. Mm. Don't give it up. And you will walk in and you will become a commercial pilot. That's very inspiring to hear from you, sir. You have mentioned that there is a lot to sacrifice and it's all about maintaining lifestyle. How a lot should a pilot be flying different time zones, flying from one country to another, so somewhere meet at a different timing, how, how, how a lot do you stay? How, how should a pilot maintain his alertness? Being at the, being responsible for so many lives of the passenger. I'm, I'm, I'm again very glad that you asked this question. A lot of mm. people don't realize mm. this side of the story. Mm. These uh, non-stop flights that we operate to America, mm. most of them depart at around one, two, three in the morning. Hmm. which means I leave my house for this flight at about 11 in the night, hmm. which means before 11 o'clock, I'm hmm. sleeping, hmm. which means at 2 in the afternoon, 3 in the afternoon, I sleep. Hmm. It's very difficult to sleep in the afternoon. Your children are awake, your friends are calling you, somebody is saying, come with me, let's go for a dinner. 
but you have to be able to say no because mm. you're going to take those 350 people on a 16 hour flight so you say no i cannot do this i have a flight to operate tonight mm. i'm going to sleep in the afternoon and i'm going to get up in the middle of the night while all of you are sleeping and mm. i'm going to go and operate that flight and be alert and ready so in the beginning i have seen some very young pilots in in my airline also mm. they don't take it seriously they will be awake till about 10 30 11 in in the night and then they will come and operate this 16 hour non-stop flight mm. but very soon in three four months they begin to realize mm. that their body can't handle it because you can't remain awake and alert for so long a period of a time mm. there is a uh, there's a joke which a friend of mine he's a surgeon mm. and when he studied in Ames mm. so his professor told him this joke he said pilots and doctors have very similar jobs they mm. both are handling very critical life situations mm. one mistake and they could lose a life mm. but the difference between this professor said the difference between the pilot and the uh, mm. the doctor is mm. that when pilot makes a mistake he mm. dies <laughs> with this mistake. <laughs> so very soon you begin to realize that you mm. are in a trade mm. where you cannot make errors and mm. live to tell the story. Mm. I mean there are so mm. many air crash investigations. Mm. You can see those videos on National Geographic Discovery mm. and you will realize that how much human factors, mm. human error is a mm. part of it. Mm. And I am part of flight safety of Air mm. India now. Mm. There is one thing that I have learned that there is no human endeavor Mm. which is without error. If you do any human endeavor, there is mm. going to be error. The idea is to reduce the error, minimize the error. We call it mitigation. So the idea is to mitigate the error, bring it into an acceptable limit and then operate the flight. So the same thing we do, we, we have to sleep, we have to eat well, mm. we have to keep our bodies sweat. Mm. We can't have, you know, fat stomachs. Mm. We can't have cardiovascular diseases. We can't have obesity. We can't, we can't afford to do that. Although there are a lot of pilots who are given into alcohol and all, but it eventually it catches up with them. One of those days they are going to be caught and mm. it does not help. So it's a, dis a very disciplined lifestyle, mm. which has its rewards, mm. but the discipline requires the sacrifice. Yes, sir. Do you have any exciting story or any any almost close to <laughs> that kind of thing, storm in the sky or some sort of yeah, there are, failures? There are actually uh, mm. multiple ones. Mm. So, uh, I mean, when you're, when you're flying, your things are bound to go wrong. Mm. So it is how you manage the mistake and you survive. Mm. And that is why I'm sitting here mm. and talking to you. <laughs> There was this one incident, uh, hmm. it was in 2011, November, hmm. so we were taking off from Trivandrum. Hmm. So as we were taxiing the aircraft, hmm. our uh, brake temperature started hmm. to rise. Hmm. So we tried to figure out whether our uh, brakes were binding, the wheel brakes were binding or no. Hmm. And we figured out that everything is okay, the brakes hmm. are not binding, brakes are fine. But the temperature hmm. was rising. So according to the book, hmm. the temperature did not reach the limit. Mm. the limit at which we are not allowed to take off so we took off when we took off the wheel came off mm. because what had happened is the person who had installed the wheel on that aircraft had installed the bearing upside down mm. instead of putting the bearing the right way mm. so as we rolled for takeoff when it reached that speed mm. the wheel came off so we took off and we realized that we lost a wheel mm. so now there is no way we can continue the flight mm. so we turned around we burnt fuel because the aircraft was above the landing weight. Mm. For almost 45 minutes, we were circling, mm. burning fuel to reduce the weight of the aircraft. And then we came back and landed. By that time, entire media in Trivandrum knew about it. Mm. There were media vans standing everywhere. Mm. And that happened to be a literary fest night mm. Mm. in Trivandrum that day. Mm. And uh, the earlier Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, mm. his daughter was there in Trivandrum, Mr. Mm. Shashi Tharoor was there in Trivandrum. Mm. So all these big dignitaries were there in Trivandrum. Mm. And so we landed uh, on the runway, declaring full emergency. So we had fire trucks and everybody waiting for us. Mm. And we came to a stop. Mm. Thankfully, by grace of God, the, the other pilot and me, we were able to handle the situation well. She was a lady pilot. She was my captain that flight. Mm. And she was very, very, very good. So with both of us teamed together, mm. we landed safely and everybody got off the plane without any injury. There was no fire. <laughs> but because we blocked the airport, mm. it became a huge news. Mm. Because now 
the Prime Minister's daughter, Mr. Shashi Tharoor, nobody could leave Trivandrum. Mm. They had to stay one more night. <laughs> so we were actually called for a big investigation mm. that uh, what actually happened and why we did what we did. So mm. uh, everything that we spoke in the cockpit was recorded. Mm. So that was played back for us. Every switch that we selected, every action that we took was recorded. Mm. And it was all investigated and after the mm. investigation, of course, they found out that we didn't do any mistake. Mm. So we were uh, uh, exonerated. Mm. But it was a very, very interesting thing. I mean, I, I made news that day. <laughs> Can you recall how the passenger rake? <laughs> they were... When we landed, uh, because we could not go to the bay, mm. so we deplaned the passengers on the runway. Mm. I saw some passengers getting off and kissing the ground. Mm. That they are back, literally <laughs> taking, <laughs> literally <laughs> kissing. I saw from my cockpit window. I was looking at the passengers, and uh, I saw them uh, literally <laughs> kissing the ground. A few of them. They were very, very thankful. And I think it more than anything else. I think more than mm. uh, more than my colleague, uh, the other mm. captain, more than mm. me, more than anything else. I think it was the grace of God mm. that it did not lead. We could have had a fire on landing because the wheel was not there. Mm. We landed without the wheel. Mm. We scratched the entire runway. Mm. So one of the back wheels had come off. So anything could have happened. But I think it was just mm. grace of God that all of us just walked off. There was and there was a point in life that you come almost close to that, right? Yeah, it was quite close. Quite close to being a very severe emergency. Mm. If the wheel had caught fire mm. after landing, mm. the plane would have caught fire. There's no way because it is right. The wheels are just above the fuel tank. Mm. The fuel tank would have ruptured and it could have been a disaster. How well, how much does the trauma haunts, haunts you after that experience? The, are you quite normal? Or you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it doesn't haunt. Uh, mm. I think uh, I want to take this opportunity to appreciate the training that Air India gives. Mm. No matter what people say mm. about Air India, mm. about the service that you get or, mm. or whatever bad experiences they have, mm. one thing people forget to realize mm. that there have never been many major Air India accidents. And that is because mm. Air India training department is one department that needs to be applauded. Mm. The training was so well done mm. that after when this emergency began to happen, mm. the training kicked in. We were mm. not thinking about the emergency anymore. Mm. We were thinking about, okay, in the training we have been told to do this. We'll do this. In the training we have been told to do this. We will do this. So mm. we were just following our training, following mm. the book. And there was just no other issue. Mm. So, if I think I did not have that great training, mm. then yes, there was a very good chance that I could have been living with trauma because mm. things could have gone wrong. Let me ask you a very simple question from the layman perspective. When we are boarding a flight, we just sit down and just enjoy it with all the announcement, the degree, the win and everything. Does a route in the sky or you can just randomly go anywhere? Uh, no, generally traffic? we don't go just where hmm. uh, we actually plan a route from one point to another point like hmm. from new delhi to usa hmm. the entire route is planned hmm. when we are flying over the particular hmm. airspace hmm. like when i'm flying over russia hmm. russia may give me a direct routing a random route they may hmm. give me but hmm. i still have to file a route hmm. so that russia knows that i'm entering their airspace at that particular time Hmm. and I'll be exiting their airspace at this particular time and I'll be following a route. So there are predetermined routes that hmm. are defined and hmm. it's the job of the flight dispatches. There is hmm. an entire department that works hmm. on planning the flight, dispatching hmm. the flight, calculating the fuel, hmm. checking the weather in all the stations. Hmm. Then they prepare what we call a flight plan hmm. and they give the flight plan to us. So hmm. then we feed the flight plan in the computer of the aircraft hmm. and then the aircraft follows that route. So yes, hmm. there is a particular route that we mm. follow mm. but there are times when some airspace may give us a direct routing throughout their airspace so. you have been flying for quite some time now do you keep on changing the the, the flight the series and the destination or you are all, always bound for one um, destination yeah what happens in uh, most of the indian airlines like mm. indigo spicejet mm. air india uh, these airlines are aircraft specific, so by mm. that I mean I am on a Boeing 777 aircraft. Mm. So Boeing 777 aircraft has been uh, uh, planned to go to US mm. and uh, we have one flight on Boeing 777 to mm. Saudi. Mm. 
Mm. So those are the only flights that I would be doing. Mm. However, there are some foreign carriers mm. like uh, uh, KLM and mm. Lufthansa. Mm. They have route specific pilots. So they, mm. their pilots may fly just one route or two route. They may only mm. fly Germany, India, Germany. Mm. But uh, in Air India, it is not like that. that mm. That's the beauty of Air India. Mm. Wherever the 777 goes, mm. I will go. Right. So on 777, I have done evacuation flights mm. and on 777, I have done uh, mm. uh, this UN peacekeeping force charter mm. operations mm. where we took UN peacekeeping force to Rwanda mm. and brought back. So wherever 777 goes, the airline will send me. I'm, and even now mm. during when the COVID pandemic started, mm. there was a lockdown on 22nd of March. Mm. We operated the first flight on 6th of April, mm. just two weeks later. Hmm. That first flight was from Delhi to Guangzhou. Hmm. We went to Guangzhou and we picked up cargo from there hmm. and started our cargo operations on 7th of April was the first Air India flight that landed. Hmm. So that was also done on 777 and all my colleagues operated that flight. So for of all the cities that you have visited or of all the airports you have landed, which airport is impressive so far? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think some of the airports in uh, Dubai hmm are very formidable they are very very beautiful mm. uh, the new dubai airport mm. is really an amazing airport even doha is very very beautiful mm. the american airports are the old tradition so mm. when you go there you feel like you've gone into a 1960s or a 70s airport mm. so they are not as advanced mm. but if you ask among cities mm. then one of my favorite city is narita Tokyo. Tokyo. So Tokyo airport is actually in another village, mm. like this beautiful village of Chirachandpur. Mm. So there's a small village called Narita. So the airport is there. Mm. It's not very advanced airport as mm. Dubai or some of the Middle East airports, mm. but it is very, very pretty. It's one of my favorite mm. places to go to. It's very quiet. The mm. people are very polite mm. and they are a lot like the Northeast people here. I, <laughs> I immediately, I can uh, attach myself, my affinity with them. Nice. Those are some of my favorite places to go. Yeah, I'm quite surprised. Let's get off. Let's get off track from your career and let's <laughs> talk something that you are interested in your hobbies and patients. Uh, many, many of the rich people don't want to invest here. They are looking for big cities or they feel this is very common place to build a house. But I, I see you with exciting projects here. <laughs> How would you describe your house here? What is so different from our typical houses here? Um, uh, let me take that question in three mm. separate uh, mm. ways. So, mm. I think why people don't invest mm. here or somewhere else they want to invest mm. is because of the definition of investment. Mm. This was something that I was actually thinking about last night. Mm. That uh, it, it depends on how you define any word. Mm. How do you define investment? Mm. So, what kind of returns are you looking for? Mm. Are you looking for financial gain? Mm. Are you looking for a, a peace in your heart, an emotional gain? So, mm. that is where the change happens. Mm. If you're looking for a financial gain, then of mm. course, you may be thinking, why don't I set up a factory somewhere in the mm. same amount of money? Mm. I can set up a small unit to mm. say produce oxygen. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, a small oxygen production plant is only about 25 lakhs. Mm. In 50 lakhs, I can set up two of those plants and make money. Mm. But am I looking for that reward? Mm. But my reward is very different. Mm. I have had a very successful, you know, financially also very successful career. Mm. Now I'm looking more for, uh, not for success as much. Mm. Now I'm looking more for significance. Mm. I want to take the second half of my life mm. and focus it toward doing something significant. Mm. How do I do that significant stuff? So my definitions change. Mm. I began to change my definitions. What are my rewards? Mm. So my rewards are you beautiful people. Mm. I cannot thank you enough for your mm. community to the way you have accepted me. I really mm. can't thank you enough. I'm always humbled. After I married my wife from the Waipay community, mm. the Waipay community has just embraced me as one of their own. Mm. They have not looked at uh, how I look Mm. whether my nose is bigger than their nose, whether my eyes are bigger than their eyes. No, mm. they look at my heart and it is your love. It's your community's love towards me that mm. has actually pulled me to this mm. area. So even though I'm making this house here, mm. 
mm. level below what I am doing the house mm. I am transferring technology mm. so there is a very old English saying that says mm. it's better to teach a man to fish mm. than to give him a fish mm. you can give a man a fish and he will be still hungry tomorrow mm. but if you teach him how to fish Mm. He will never hunger again because then he can go and fish mm. for himself. Mm. So my idea here has been that this technology that I'm bringing here, this mm. style of making a home, mm. is a very different from what homes are made over here. Mm. It is largely inspired by the American, the Western way of building a wooden house. Mm. So I'm trying to transfer this technology mm. to the people who are actually building this house. Mm. I want to excite people over here. I want mm. people to come. Mm. Like I'm so thankful you came that you are able to showcase this. Mm. I'm I'm inviting people to come to the farm, have a look at it. That a house can be built in this way as well. You can have <laughs> the the luxuries, mm. the comfort mm. of a cement house like the mm. one you get in the city, mm. using a material which is easily available here mm. and much more beautiful than what you can do. Mm. So it's not just. Making something or investing here, I, mm. I'm actually trying to invest into the lives of the people more than that. Can we move around and see and can you yes, explain yes. to me technically how different sure. it is? Yes. Yeah, so I was thinking we are coming too early to have the interview, but you are saying it's the right time because we can still technically see what is the structure of this house. The first simple question I'd like to ask you, how much difference would it make with the local house that we are building here? The, in terms of cost. In terms of cost, mm. um, I believe in terms of cost, the mm. most, uh, the biggest expense mm. in terms of cost is actually the time, mm. the time taken to build it, mm. because of the precision required in building this house, mm. it takes two to three times more time mm. to do it. Mm. The material-wise, I'm using same material which anybody here may be using. Mm. This is Chal thing. Mm. I'm not using Burma teak. Mm. I'm using the local wood. Mm. And this is pine. This is also mm. again local pine, mm. not the Burma pine. So mm. which people are extensively using. But it is the way I'm using the Chal thing is different from what they generally do. Mm. For example, one of the first things that people may notice when they see this place mm. is that the gap between the first pillar and the second pillar is mm. quite a lot. It's almost, it's eight feet over here. Mm. And if we go on the other side of the house, mm. we will see it is 12 feet. I will mm. take you that side and show you. Mm. So 12 feet uh, span, mm. how do you make 12 feet span mm. support a heavy structure? Mm. So that is where the technique comes. So mm. if you see over here, mm. in this entire length, mm. it's 12 feet. Hmm. So in this length, there is no support in the middle. Hmm. The entire weight of the house is hmm. resting on this joist. Hmm. I am. I, I try to learn the Manipur, the Vaipen or the names, not traditional hmm. names. Hmm. This is Kalvai, I believe, and this is Kaldung. <laughs> so this whole weight is resting on this Kalvai. Hmm. So this Kalvai had to be six inches. Mm. or more. If it is less than six inches, mm. it will not be able to support the weight. Okay. So I had to look for wood that was mm. six inches. Mm. That's the other second difference. And these are how there are like four sets of major kalvai that go on which the kaldunga is sitting and then on top of the kaldung the floorboard will come. Mm. So this is the second major difference that the wood pieces that I'm using mm. are much more wider. This is five inch and this is six inch. Mm. so that it can support the weight of the house. I the third difference is mm. the way the pillar has been set up. Mm. So the weight of the house is not on the pillar. Mm. The weight of the house rests on this joist. Mm. From here it gets transferred to this joist mm. and from there it gets transferred directly to this cement pillars. Mm. It does not come on the pillars. Mm. In the other home construction, mm. a lot of weight comes on the pillars. Mm. So this is the third a different major design mm. of it. So these uh, uh, these bangus that I have put, mm. the studs, mm. they are not structural. You can remove them and just on these eight pillars, the entire house will stand. Mm. That, the, those are the few major points about it. Is this dismantable? Yes. We can dismantle and remove it? Yes. So in order to do that, mm. uh, this structure is screwed on. Mm. This structure also 
mm. is screwed on mm. to uh, this calvi. Mm. These are all screws. Mm. So you can probably come close and zoom in. Mm. Uh, this member, I custom made it mm. from uh, one of the shops here in New Lamka. Mm. And these are screws. So you can just open these screws, open these screws, and this piece will come out. Mm. So you can dismantle this house in no time. Mm. and you can reassemble it all over again. Nice. There are no nails being used anywhere. Sure. It's all nuts and bolts. Mm. This mm. Uh, kaldung comes over here, this mm. kalvai, and it is bolted mm. through this over here. Mm. Just like if you see on top. Mm. Those are the bolts that are holding on to this. I hope you are aware that this part of the mountain is sometimes stormy and there are speed of winds there. How stable is this? Did it, how, how well did you do your research about the wind, the wind speed here? So I studied the last 100 year mm. uh, history of the climatic conditions. Yes, of uh, whatever weather events have happened mm. in this area. Mm. One of the events that happened was, I believe, in 1927 or 1934, I don't remember it now. Mm. It was a major storm that mm. came here mm. where you had winds in this area mm. at the at maybe 100 kilometers an hour winds you had here. Mm. There was another event, I think in 1978 or somewhere. These are two major events. Mm. You haven't had any worse than that. Mm. So when I began to calculate the structural strength of this house, mm. I have tried to work it to about 120, 130 kilometer an hour winds. Mm. Up to 130 kilometer an hour winds, this house will remain stable. Mm. To give you a comparison, Mm. Uh, without saying, I, I don't mean to demean, but uh, mm. uh, uh, you see that house over there. Mm. In about 80 km hour winds, mm. that house top will fly away. It cannot hold. Mm. So comparing that to this, it's mm. about 120 km, 130 km winds, it mm. will sustain. Mm. It will sustain earthquake of up to about 7 on the Richter scale. Mm. So even though the investment is more, mm. but it is a more long lasting investment. So the financial returns don't mm. come to you in terms of uh, mm. the expense on the house, mm. but that your house will last you longer, mm. maybe 20 years, maybe 30 years, mm. this house will last. So mm. that is where I would like to encourage people to think about it. Mm. Why make a house that every five years you need to do some sort of a, you know, repair in it or a reconstruction in it. Why not mm. do it in a way that it can be improved Mm. to live up to 20, 30, 40 years, maybe 50 years also. This mm. house may not go bad. Mm. So that is where it can give you the financial return, even though that is not what I'm looking for, but mm. that's how it can change. How so. challenging it is to get local mystery to build this kind of house, which they are never have experience or have any idea. <laughs> that are, is, they, are they coping up with the ideas? Yes, it, it's a, this, is a, this is an interesting challenge. So mm. uh, as you were talking earlier that, mm. uh, I believe that mm. if you have the person with the right attitude, mm. then he can be trained to do this. Mm. Now this little team that we have mm. formed, mm. Uh, which maybe we can meet later, mm. this team has already begun to catch up the concept That's of it. this house. Mm. It has taken some time. Mm. There are sometimes language barriers as well. Mm. So I try to bridge them. So mm. I'm trying to bring them up to mm. be able to comfortably build this house. That is where the technology transfer which I was talking about, mm. that is where that is happening. Mm. Once this house is built, mm. I believe the team that we have created here mm. will be able to build a second house just like this mm. with very little supervision from me. Mm. And maybe by the third or the fourth house, mm. I think they will be uh, very or confident to build on their own. Yes, mm. they would become. So and that is where they may be able to bring this technology to more people. Right. You know, those who are willing to mm invest maybe twice than what they would like to do, they can get this quality of house. So it's not only about buying woods, structuring, you come all the way, you got all, you assemble up all your machines and equipment like this. Is there any reason why you have to buy all these things? Is it not costing you too much? It, 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 why don't it, you go to local carpenters, ask, tell them the size, the shape, why do you need all these expensive machines? Yeah, I hit a roadblock and why I had to buy this machine. I Initially, I only bought uh, this machine mm. and some smaller tools mm. to help me finish my work. Mm. So this is actually a planer mm. and uh, the, this, is, this does the same job mm. which a hand planer does. The only difference is that 
mm. its blade is almost 12 inches mm. and it can uh, mm. plane the entire board at the correct height mm. so when you're putting a floor board in here it mm. comes out very beautiful on the other side very clean but this machine i had to buy because mm. the need arose mm. i wanted to cut wood in a very precise fashion mm. uh, one of the questions you asked earlier is how much precision is required in this house mm. since this house only has eight pillars mm. and the entire weight of the house estimated weight is about 2.4 tons 2400 kilos to about 2600 kilos will be the weight of this house mm. having eight pillars hold 2.6 ton weight mm. if those pillars are not straight they mm. will fail if one pillar is a little crooked mm. when the weight falls on it it will collapse Mm. So that precision is required. Mm. So when I approach some of the people here to give me wood that is cut in exact way that I want, mm. they said they would not be able to do it. Mm. And so then I decided, okay, if that mm. is the thing, then mm. I have to invest. Mm. So I bought this bandsaw, which is mm. giving me very, very precise cuts. Mm. So between these two machines, Mm. Most of this wood has been prepared mm. just by these two machines. Mm. So I can get precise cut, mm. precise size. Mm. Uh, one of the things which I found very interesting mm. uh, in this area mm. is that they say dui char, which mm. basically means 2 inch by 4 inch. Mm. So I made my calculations using 2 inch by 4 inch, but when I came mm. and I saw it is not 2 inches, it's quarter to 2 inches. Mm. And it is not four inch, it is three and a half inch. And they call it doichar. Mm. So I was completely bewildered. I said, what will I do now? Because all my calculations mm. were based on a two by four wood. Mm. And you're giving me a wood which is much smaller than two by four. And that is why I had to specially go and search those bigger wood, which I had to pay a little extra. Mm. But the, the, the size that they tell is always smaller. Mm. And the side. This, this I find very, very interesting I in this see. part of the city. So how do you try to landscape the whole project here? So this is going to be the... Uh, this will be the caretaker's house. Mm, caretaker's so house. this oh. would be the service mm. gate uh, where mm. the Innova is parked. Mm. So all the service uh, things for the house, mm. like gas, mm. groceries, mm. Um, you know, equipment, everything will come from the service gate. Mm. not from the main gate mm. so where we are standing mm. we plan to build a tennis court over here this for private use and uh, i will be opening it up later on to people as well mm. but uh, as of now the plan is to mm. uh, have it for family and for friends mm. so mm. this will be a 140 feet by mm. 40 feet mm. wide uh, tennis court mm. and then we plan to build a second house over there which mm. will be our residence okay. so this house will be uh, always occupied mm. by the caretaker Mm. That house will remain occupied, unoccupied. I will open it up to all my friends. Mm. You are also welcome to come and stay here. <laughs> I, I even have dreamed to put a website mm. so you can go on the calendar on the website. I'm just impressed with this <laughs> <laughs> creative water <laughs> storage. Yes. Yeah, just looking at the landscape and you come up with the idea, right? Yes. So this, uh, mm. I believe that whenever we start a project at a very virgin mm. site, this was a very virgin site. Mm. So you need to have a good uh, mm. water system. Mm. You need to have mm. good electricity mm. system. So mm. this was one of the very, very first things that I came and I did mm. so that water is available. Mm. And uh, we got one, we had an extra mm. RO unit back home in Delhi. Mm. So we brought this unit and installed it here so that mm. we can have uh, pure drinking water as well, mm. cleaning water. Mm. So the idea is that you pump it once mm. and the energy is stored in the water. Mm. So you're not pumping it every time when you need it. You pump it mm. once in the morning or once in the evening mm. and then whole day water is available. Mm. So this line feeds back into the mm. farm. Mm. So this line is being used currently to feed the farm. Mm. Mm. In future, this system mm. will be far more complicated mm. and it may not be here. I may move it mm. back to that area, mm. but this is just a temporary structure mm. just uh, till the construction is on. This mm. is how we'd like to do. So you have been to many different places, the most exotic uh, top holiday destination. So don't you think these places also equally beautiful as much as the other places in the world? Oh yes. <laughs> Oh yes, you name it. I mean, it is not. Uh, it's. it's mm. uh, I feel it's not strange that when they call uh, Shillong mm. as the Swiss of the East, mm. the entire Northeast has that beauty. Mm. So, 
the only difference in those tourist destinations and mm. northeast some areas of northeast mm. is the mindset that people have towards mm. that place mm. like uh, for example if you go to scandinavian countries mm. or you go to japan mm. the people there themselves without any law the mm. people themselves there are very strict about mm. keeping it naturally beautiful mm. i feel that one place where northeast mm. may be suffers maybe it is hurting mm. is that uh, the people who are god has given mm. you know the responsibility to look after the place mm. i feel sometimes there is a little gap they are not looking it after as well mm. but in terms of beauty it's it's nothing less mm. in probably in 3 or 4 months time maybe 6 months time mm. you will see this entire place mm. in a very different way it will mm. it will not not look like a place which has been rummaged mm. or destroyed it won't mm. look like that it would actually look like something which is mm. being inculcated mm. and uh, it is for the same reason that i'm using mm. bamboo also <laughs> because for the toilet right it needs to be something mm. that is mm. available here easily available mm. and easily installable mm. easily repairable mm. and eco friendly mm. so Uh, one huge thing that i would actually like to really help which i have been working on a few years mm. is the plastic menace in northeast mm. especially in churchandpur and namka mm. the plastic will kill you mm. it will kill you people are not realizing mm. when even when i have instructed my people also whenever they go buy vegetables and other things mm. i've asked them not to take it in a plastic bag mm. i've bought them a cloth bag uh, over there Mm. they are supposed to take the cloth bag get mm. the vegetables in the cloth mm. bag bring it back because plastic mm. it can stay for 400 years mm. and that kind of garbage we do not have the facility here to recycle it mm. but this is biodegradable mm. so people don't use it because people say in few years it degenerates mm. but that is the beauty of the product mm. it degenerates and you put it again mm. so that it goes back into the ground from where it came mm. the plastic you put mm. it here it's mm. going to last 400 years mm. you can't biodegrade it what are you going to do with that much waste mm. so that that's why i'm actually in love with all this and i did not put a cement wall mm. it is so beautiful mm. it doesn't heat up mm. it maintains mm. it gives privacy mm. it allows air mm. to flow also <laughs> it is it, i'm just trying to use what is naturally available here to its benefit mm. i feel that when god uh gives a certain kind of vegetation to a certain area mm. he keeps in mind the requirement of that area and then gives the vegetation like bamboo is not so easily available in delhi mm. in delhi it doesn't have that much of a use but mm. this area mm. i believe bamboo is a wonder product mm. you can do so much mm. with bamboo mm. so i'm trying to incorporate as much as i can even the doors for this my work shed mm. are going to be bamboo So you are sleeping here in the tent doing all this walk? Yes, this is the <laughs> most the best part of the entire project <laughs> is that I get to sleep here mm. and mm. people they buy posters mm. of this view mm. and they put it in their bedroom. Mm. But my bedroom has a real view. So when I get up in the morning, <laughs> I open the zip of the tent and I can see this beautiful exotic view. What what is what is what is the observation of your neighbor are they curious oh, these people are sleeping in the tent <laughs> are they curious yeah i think so a uh, few people when they pass by they do stop by and look that what are they up to so yeah they yeah, they do that <laughs> but i'm glad that i got this opportunity mm. uh, most of my friends are very very jealous of me mm. and i think when they see this they're going to be far more jealous mm. because i'm living their dream they want to come out in the <laughs> nature they want to live in a tent Mm. they want to enjoy this every morning mm. but i'm doing it i'm doing it for the last 3 <laughs> 4 weeks now mm. so yeah they are very jealous so I, i'm i'm mm. i'm very glad that mm. india has a place which is northeast mm. i'm very glad that it is part of my nation that i don't need a passport mm. or a visa to come here mm. i'm glad that my wife being from waipet tribe can purchase a piece of land mm. and that we can build this and call it home mm. this is not foreign for me i don't feel a mm. foreigner here mm. so th- th- those parts those are the things that really mm. pull me mm. into this place anyway it's great talking to you sir i think through your project many of our concept would be changed 
Some locals, whenever they see anything that is foreign, they tend to love it. But God wants us to make use of the best of what He has given us. Yes, yes. I hope many, people, many viewers would be inspired by our interview. We can hold any camp to the Sarbobi to Kiona. Yet, as Ota Yay Kiona, but in Zilin Tampioma, a diag in Zilite Adin. Do you have any last message that you want to say to the people of Lamka or here? <laughs> um, I would like to say two special things to everyone who's uh, listening to us and who will be watching. Uh, number one is never give up your dreams. Uh, you don't know my, my childhood. It may appear as if that I come from a rich family, but there was a stage in my life when I was about 17, 18 years old when I lost everything. Because I accepted Christ, my Sikh family could not keep me anymore. I was literally on the streets of Delhi. I slept for three weeks on the streets of Delhi. I used to sleep in a park or in a bus station. From there, the Lord Almighty brought me to where I am. And why did He do that? I think for two reasons. One, because I gave my life to Him. I just loved Him with all of my heart, with all of my mind, my understanding. And the second is the dreams and the passions that I followed. So I would say do not give up your dream and your passion, no matter what happens. You could be in the worst of situations. Even right now when you're watching us, you could be going through a huge trial in your life. But remember one thing, Bible says, everything shall come to pass. It will all pass away. So don't give up your dreams, hold on to them. And the second thing that I would like to share with the viewers, of course, most of it will going to be Northeast people who will see this. So I want to thank you. I want to say Kipak Talui for having me as your Makpa. And I would like to encourage you to please look after your land. Change the way you think about your land. This is a precious place that the Lord has given you. It has immense beauty. And you people are simple. You are loving from your heart. So inculcate that. Grow in that. Even if you come and visit us, we'll share with you how you can use natural resources to build things that can last you for ages. You don't have to look at other people. It's all here. Everything is available here. So just want to thank you guys and I want to thank On Bill Television as well for uh, showcasing this little humble effort that we are doing. I want to thank Mang for taking his precious time out and I really want to thank you again for that. It's a pleasure, sir. Yai yai video so yai documentary na nero pat ba nang ay dano feedback na comment social media enten ka hon petosil ng kongyan o dahil tunay din weekend hon yai tanaw sa utahe.